Michael Corlum here, and today I'm playing the first Ultima game. This video isn't going to be a walkthrough or really a standard let's play, because the game is mostly grinding and I'm just going to skip over that part, but I'll be evaluating its gameplay and storytelling and the contextual framework as one of the very first computer role-playing games. Ultima, like a call about before it, was based on 19-year-old Richard Garriott's home Dungeons & Dragons game. It was one of the first CRPGs I ever played on the Apple IIs in the library I would visit as a kid. Originally developed for the Apple II, it was ported to a number of different microcomputer platforms and saw a number of re-releases and remasters, including the PC version you can buy as part of the Ultima 123 bundle on GOG.com, which is probably your easiest option if playing on a modern machine. Even then, though, the controls aren't very friendly and it has few quality of life improvements. I'll be playing the 1986 Apple II re-release. It plays exactly like the original, but runs faster because it was rewritten from basic to assembler, and the game fits on a single floppy. We'll need a second blank floppy to save our character because hard drives were far from the standard in this era. It also adds the animated intro that we're looking at, but as far as I remember, it doesn't really change anything else. Right away, we can see its tabletop RPG lineage in the character creation screen. Our stats are strength, agility, stamina, charisma, wisdom, and intelligence. Not exactly the same as in D&D, and not on a 3 to 18 scale, but close enough. We buy our stats here, spending 90 total and ending up with between 10 and 25 in each. We can also choose between humans, elves, dwarves, and bobbits, renamed from the hobbits of the initial release to avoid conflict with the Tolkien estate, and the only impact they give you is bonus stats. We pick human for a plus 5 to an intelligence. Finally, we get a class, Fighter, Cleric, Wizard, and Thief, and again, the only real difference is a stat bonus. Magic works the same for all characters, and all can try stealing and picking locks. We're going to go Wizard for a plus 10 intelligence, putting us at 40 total. Intelligence impacts the power of our spells, but that's not why we chose it. We won't be casting much for the bulk of the game, it also impacts the price of goods we buy at market, and at the beginning of the game, that's going to be our primary concern. I'll get to why in a second. We're going to give our character a name, save it, and boom. We're in the world of Sasoria in the lands of Lord British. Who are we? What are we doing here? We don't know. In 1980, Ultima 1 was just Ultima, a game not really intended to kick off a nine-game series full of whatever 19-year-old Richard Garriott thought would be cool at the time and based off of his home D&D game. The manual's instructions on how to play were given tips on character creation and weapon use, but nothing about the setting or plot. This is greatly expanded by the time of the re-release, when there were three games out in this series, but for this video I'm going to proceed with what the original release gave us. We're a guy in a field. Now, take a close look at the screen. This is a tile-based overworld, the first RPG to sport one, an innovation that more than anything else impacts the course of RPG history, particularly in Japan where it becomes one of the foundational elements of the JRPG genre. Our only clue as to where to go or what to do is that castle to the west. But first let's take a look at our stats with the stats command. We can see that we have 150 hits, that's hit points, 200 food, 0 experience, and 100 coin, and none of those work the way you'd assume from modern games. First of all, hits, uh, hit points. There's no healing, there's no resting, the cap is 9,999, and you get more by either ha giving money to kings or by killing monsters in dungeons and returning to the surface world. They function a bit like experience points in that regard. But what do the experience points do? Nothing really. Uh, you need to reach level 8 by the end of the game, but that's just a content lock. Going up a level doesn't improve your stats or anything else. Uh, and you get experience by fighting, sure, but also just by walking around. It's kind of a weird stat. Food is frustrating. You're constantly eating. And by constantly, I mean one unit every two steps in the overworld. And if you run out, you instantly starve to death. It's an obnoxious mechanic that remains a factor in CRPGs for far too long and leads us to understand that either we're under a curse to just eat constantly or die, or that a turn in the overworld is like a day or so. Given that the world is about the size of Earth, that makes a little more sense, but it still feels kind of bad. This is also why we started with the high intelligence. At 40, food has gone from costing 4 coins per 10 units to 3 coins per 10 units. And in the beginning, food is going to be our primary concern. 
Now, the key we pressed to bring up the stat screen was Z for stats. S is already mapped to steel, so Gary chose Z. Many of the commands are simple and easy to remember. Arrow keys to move, A to attack, C to cast a spell. But we have 20 different commands mapped to 20 different letters. Climb is K. B is board, either a boat or a house. E is enter, and X is exit, only used to dismount or disembark. So commands are kind of all over the place. I would recommend keeping a reference handy. Anyway, this castle provides a good point of interest to guide us towards, and as we approach, we see a second map icon, a town this time. The castle doesn't have much to offer at the moment, so we head to the town instead and find ourselves in Britain. Every town is basically the same. You've got your shops, you can buy food, you can hit the pub. Some towns have a different layout, some might be missing the food store, which can kill you if you don't have enough to make it somewhere you can stock up, and each store will have one of two sets of inventory. We're going to start by buying a whole lot of food, enough to keep us going while we grind for a bit. We're going to hit T, not for talk, but transact. There's not a lot in the way of casual chatting in Ultima. We're going to buy 10 packs, which is 100 food, which will last us an extra 200 turns on foot. Fortunately, there are other options. Transport in this game primarily serves to reduce the amount of food you eat per turn, but the better options like Frigate give you cannons to attack with. Right now we can afford the horse, which cuts our consumption in half. Now we have precious few coins left for weapon and armor, and our beginning leather armor and daggers just won't do, so we're going to have to steal them. Stealing is simple. We go behind the counter, as far away from the shopkeeper as possible, and hit S. If we get caught, all the shops close and the guards come to kill us. But if we succeed, you can get any weapon in the game, even those that the shops aren't offering yet. We get real lucky, stealing a vacuum suit and a greatsword. What's a vacuum suit, you might ask? Well, that's what asteroids wear in outer space. That's right, Ultima has science fiction high technology elements in a largely fantasy milieu. Young Richard Garriott's design philosophy was pretty much, if it's cool, throw it in, in a sort of clumsy and haphazard way. The technology, up to and including spaceships and blasters, does not otherwise impress itself upon the story or setting of the game. These technological artifacts just are existing and are sort of ignored after Ultima 3. We could keep pressing our luck, but the greatsword and vacuum armor are good enough for now. It's time to hit the dungeons and grind. Like the town, the dungeons are pretty much the same aside from layout, so we'll just hit monitor, the closest one. Each dungeon level has the same monsters on it, but monitor has a chest right near the entrance, so we can jump down, grab it, and return to the stairs, and run to nearby paws if we need some food. The dungeon will have reset when we return, so we can just keep doing this. As an added bonus, if we kill monsters and leave, we're given a bunch of hit points. Grinding for this for hits and gold is our first activity. Anyway, dungeons are much safer for us than the overworld for two reasons. One, encounters are restricted by dungeon level. And two, we use food at a much reduced rate. It just takes a while. For now, I'm going to scrape up enough coin to buy a ship, which will get us to a whole new level of tedious grinding. Alright, we've earned enough to buy a ship, so we're heading back to Britain to set sail. The frigate is an expensive option, but our best bet, as its cannons will let us sail up and down the coast, sniping monsters safely from shore. Few of them have ranged attacks, and our 500 hit points will see us through the rare seafaring beast that we might encounter. The next phase in our grind fest is a sail between points of interest called signs or monuments. First, though, we're going to pay a visit to Lord British. Each continent has two castles, and in each castle we can pledge service to the king. Generally, this is either to visit a specific sign or to kill a specific monster. Lord British is asking us to visit the Grave of the Lost Soul. And finally, we have a quest. It's still not our primary gameplay task, we won't figure that out for a while, but if we visit the Grave in return, he'll give us points of strength. The Castle of the Lost King, just across the bay, gives us a quest to kill a gelatinous cube, which we can find down on the third or fourth level of any dungeon. We'll do that later, because first we need to grind some shrines. You see, in addition to the king's quests to visit specific shrines, each shrine gives a different attribute bonus. So when we sail between them, and it works as long as you're not trying to visit the same one immediately after leaving, we can bump our stats up relatively quickly. The boost is less the higher the stat, but our lowest stats are giving us 10 or 11 per visit. 
If it's your first time playing or if you just don't want to go online to find a map, you're going to have to explore around to find them. The original 1980 release didn't come with a map of any kind, and the re-release's map is cool, but it doesn't have a key. Still, once you've got your bearings, you can plot a course that lets you hit each sign in turn, and sailing around, sniping monsters on this route is our next big grindfest. Well, we've got stats in the 70s and 80s now, except for strength. There are no strength-related monuments, so we're going to have to grind the quest where a king tells you to visit somewhere specific. Lord British's quest for the Grave of the Lost Soul fits into our route well enough to be hit every so often, but there's really no fast way to build it up. It's now time to handle our gear. One of the features of the game is that visiting shrines also unlocks more options than the shops, but we're not going to be going shopping, or stealing. The Pillars of the Argonauts is a shrine that gives you equipment when you visit it, in order from the least powerful weapon in the game that you don't possess to the most. It's located between the Wisdom and Intelligence Gathering Shrines, so we can create a fast route running between them to, relatively quickly, work our way up to the Blaster, the most powerful weapon. This doesn't work with armor, so we're just going to have to buy ourselves a suit of Reflect Armor from the shop, but it's not too expensive. While we're at it, we can also buy an Air Car, a vehicle that can go over flat land and water with a laser cannon that looks a lot like a speeder from Star Wars. And since we're here, we might as well also buy ourselves a shuttle. That's a space shuttle. We're not ready for it, but we'll need it later. As we've finished grinding, you might wonder how it is that you're supposed to know what you're doing. Some games of the era did have a very just-try-things-out-and-you-figure-it-out attitude towards the player's goals. And in the re-release, the game manual spells out that the land is plagued by the evil wizard Mondane, and that you need to slay him, and later games imply that you, the stranger, are answering the call of Lord British. None of that is in the first release's manual, but you can get the basic premise by transacting at a pub. You'll spend a coin on drink, and the bartender will tell you a rumor, but if you drink too often, which can be as few as twice in some cases, you'll get drunk and a wench will steal half of your gold. This is the earliest way to get useful information in the game, and there are four specific rumors that give players direction. Let me tell you what they are, uh, presented to the player randomly. Thou had best know that over a thousand years ago, Mondain the wizard created an evil gem. With this gem, he is, he is immortal and cannot be defeated. The quest of Ultima is to traverse the lands in search of a time machine. Upon finding such a device, thou should go back in time to the days before Mondain created the evil gem and destroy him. Uh, yes, this breaks the fourth wall, and it is a huge info dump, but it's the only real way of learning the main quest of the game. If the player decides to waste enough time drinking and risking half your coin in the, in the tavern, that is. Thou had best know that the princess will give great rewards to those who rescue her and an extra gift to an 8th level ace. The exact impact isn't immediately apparent here because the reward is in fact mission critical, but it lets you know the requirements. Rescue a princess, be 8th level, and an ace. What's an ace, you may ask? Well, our third vital rumor tells us. Thou had best know about space travel. Thou must destroy at least 20 enemy vessels to become an ace. And yeah, that's what we're going to need our shuttle for. Thrilling space combat, but we're not quite there yet. First, we have four more quests to complete. While half of our kings gave us simple quests to visit points of interest in exchange for strength, the other four ask us to kill specific monsters in the dungeon. We need to kill a gelatinous cube on level 3 or 4, a carrion crawler on level 5 or 6, a Lich on 7 or 8, and a Balrog, renamed Balron in the re-release, on level 9 or 10. So that's next. We're going to head back to Britain and prepare for this last step. Buying extra armor, because the gelatinous cube will eat what you're wearing, and finally buying our first wizard spell, Ladder Down, which will immediately drop us down a dungeon level, and Ladder Up, which will bring us back up. Uh, these appeal to me, because even with a map, I'm terrible at navigating grid dungeons. So, down we go into the dungeon. This will be relatively quick, because we don't want to tarry. Our target monsters aren't the most dangerous, but gelatinous cubes will eat our armor, gremlins are around that can steal half our food with each hit, and mind flayers damage our intelligence scores. We get lucky, though, and each of our foes goes down pretty quick, and we're able to jaunt back to the surface without too much trouble. It is worth grinding a little on levels 5 and 6 between the cubes and the gremlins to replenish our coins and hit points. We're also going to be need to be level 8 soon, but our next step gets us a lot of experience. We need to become that space ace. Since we've bought our shuttle, we can just jump and go into space. 
This is essentially an entirely new game, similar to the old Star Trek microcomputer games or Star Raiders on the Atari 2600. The controls are entirely different than the rest of the game. Up is thrust, down is retro rockets to counter thrust, and left and right rotate us 90 degrees. We want to dock with this space station here, something that takes pixel perfect perfection if you don't want to damage your ship. And once we've done so, we can switch to the, one of the other ships. They have guns, but only the shuttle can land on the planet. So the big ship carries more fuel and the little one has stronger shields. Almost everything we do, thrusting, firing, turning, takes fuel, so we'll have to dock to refuel and recharge our shields a few times to pursue our goal of becoming an ace. A goal that, again, requires us to shoot down 20 enemy ships. And to find those ships, we need to use the galaxy map. The diamonds you see are stars, the H's are sectors of enemies, and our planet is in the center sector here. To jump from sector to sector, we need to enter first-person view and hit hyperspace, while facing the direction we want to jump. Here, the closest sector with an enemy is pretty far, and each jump is going to use up 100 fuel. Alright, now that we're in an enemy sector, we can try to shoot down some ships that totally aren't Star Wars TIE Fighters. In first-person mode, we control the cursor with our arrow keys and fire with F, while space allows us to quickly center the cursor. The enemy ships appear in the corners and quickly fly off screen, unless we pen them in with our cursor, which they'll try to avoid. This forces them closer, and we can try shooting them, though observe that just moving the cursor uses fuel, so you have to be careful and smart about who you try to hurt away and who you let go. Once they're close enough, and therefore big enough targets, you can try shooting them, and they can try shooting at you. This is yet another grind. We need 20 kills to become an ace, and any given sector will only have a few enemies, so we're going to fly around, kill them, and return to our space station to refuel as often as necessary. This does earn us a lot of experience, which is good, because we're going to need to hit 8 level before the end game. And we're an ace! Great! We just need to kill off the last enemies and we can fly home. Now we're going to turn in all of those kill the enemy quests from the dungeons, and in doing so, the kings will give us gems and clue us in about what we need to do to win. Travel back in time before Mondain was invincible and rescue a princess. Which princess? It doesn't matter. Each king has a princess locked up in their dungeon. To get them out, we need to murder a jester, break her out, killing any guard to try to stop us. This tells us a lot about the morality of the early Ultima games. You're expected, in fact required, to behave this way, and even the good and noble kings have princesses locked up in their dungeons. This alone might be the biggest piece of world building in the game. Anyway, Princess Rescued, she gives us the last piece of information we need, the location of the time machine. Well, it's general direction anyway, we still need to go search for it. You can actually rescue princesses anytime you feel tough enough to take on the castle guards. Rescues will earn you gold, hit points, and experience, but unless you're a level 8 ace, you won't hear about the time machine. And it won't appear on the map. It's a vehicle, so we're just going to go to it and get yet more story in the form of a tech stump, one of the two the game gives you. It also brings you to the final fight with Mondain. This is a bit of a puzzle. His gem gives him immortality, so you need to smash it before you can kill him. And this is the one time in the game you need to use the G grab command instead of stay steal. But even without the gem, Mondain is a tough fight. He does tremendous damage, and as long as the gem is there, he won't permanently die. Maybe the most difficult part is that he'll turn into a bat and run away, forcing you to corner him just to get a few hits in. But if you have enough hits to outlast him, you'll eventually beat him and be treated to the game's ending scroll. And that's it! That's Ultima, a kitchen sink mishmash of setting elements with an inconsistent morality and clashing gameplay elements, but a classic genesis of the computer RPG genre doesn't hold the player's hand at all in terms of lore and backstory or even telling you what you're supposed to be doing with a complicated control scheme and uneven difficulties. Even for fans of older games and old RPGs, I would not recommend getting into the Ultima series prior to Ultima 4, and if clunky UIs turn you off, maybe stick to 7. 